And to sit nine is a bull that uh, we met when he was just in a new world cup. And he's a byproduct of the milk industry. And uh, at the time, he was uh, on his way to a feedlot uh, to get slaughtered. And as time passed, we discovered that there was a hearing and a bunch of um, and anonymous activists of the 269 uh, left movement um, broke in uh, to the place where he was uh, being held and uh, liberated him uh, by the nickel time. Ever since he has been living a uh, ideal uh, life and freedom, and uh, so that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> the central theme of our uh, movement is that uh, we try to emphasize that each and every animal is an individual instead of a number or whatever. And we do it by symbolizing this one calf's life. Of course, we don't believe it's like uh, and the only example of uh, and, and uh, and, and anyone that should get uh, this sort of treatment is just uh, an example that helps people to understand because, uh, and, as you know, humans are very limited in their ability to see uh, uh, huge numbers, like uh, see a huge crowd, uh, see it as a crowd and not as um, like, like, uh, individuals that make a bad crowd. And so we try to uh, show that, uh, that each and every one of them has a special uh, individual. Um, we brand ourselves with a uh, red foot medal, which uh, sounds pretty dumb to some people, uh, but uh, in reality, we think it's a, it's a very good way to show uh, our empathy and solidarity with uh, other animals that get uh, mistreated in the world. Um, we do it because uh, we believe uh, that uh, the pain that they feel uh, uh, is the same pain that uh, we feel. So it doesn't matter if you are a cow or a pig or a chicken uh, or a human being, uh, the pain is the same. Uh, the only difference is that uh, we know that uh, after the branding is over, we'll get treatment and respect and we'll be okay, but uh, they have no idea. And all we know is that uh, they are being mistreated and they are fearing from the dead. From the dead. Um, and of course, uh, they get the, the knife to the throat and then, uh, yeah, so it's pretty sad. Our movement is, uh, is no center uh, leadership, and uh, no salaries, and is open for everybody to uh, join. And uh, we want it to be as an, an open platform for activists to use uh, uh, for the activism, be it by direct action, educational work, um, or art of all sorts, and um, through college uh, pretty much. Um, our goal is to empower and, uh, and uh, uh, all kinds of creative and bold uh, activism from all, all around the world. And our next event uh, will be held in uh, a short time. It's called the Respect Life, how we call it end. Uh, already we have uh, 70 cities uh, included in this one. And uh, it's growing uh, today. So, it's nice. So, now, now I'm going to show some videos of our uh, actions. So, we'll see, you see what we're doing. Uh, this, uh, ah, yeah. Hi, can you see? You see Maria? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's very cute. In the meantime, I will tell you about uh, the first video. Uh, actually, it's uh, the talking deck, so it's great. Uh, so the first video is uh, from uh, the first version of in Israel history. Uh, and actually, we, like our activists were able to liberate uh, 104 tanks from uh, an egg laying facility. Uh, before this uh, liberation uh, after it happened, there was a uh, Undercover investigation, which involved a lot of cruelty. Like uh, you can see, like uh, hands being eaten alive by rats, and uh, their bodies are left inside the the the, the cages, which I guess is not uh, very uncommon. And so, I show you this.
play. Eres. And the next video is from uh, an action we did in a uh, uh, butcher shop, which is owned by a company named Zoglove. Uh, the company was under investigation by uh, uh, Anonymous, not uh, the hacker group, but uh, the Israeli animal rights uh, organization. Uh, so we went inside and uh, made some uh, little uh, changes in our decor. Uh, <laughs> we received a lot of blood, which, uh, as I said yesterday, is my uh, special thing. אהההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההה
Uh, I'm here uh, as someone who has cared, rescued and cared for literally hundreds and hundreds of chickens over the course of the past 15 years. And I am here to tell you that the life of a single lion is in fact worth mourning and protesting on its own, uh, without any resentful references to other lives lost. I know cows, I know a lot of cows. Cows, cows are so compassionate and kind and caring, and I think that I, I cannot imagine that any cow that I know, I try to imagine what any cow that I know would think if they knew that there were people here at this conference purporting to speak on behalf of farmed animals, and yet telling people to be less compassionate and caring towards non-farmed animals, or towards human concerns. I, I think they would not be able to make any sense at all of the idea that people purporting to represent their interests were encouraging people to become more cats to some other kind of suffering, to some other animal. Um, so um, I'm, I'm here to tell you that, but I'll get back to that, and then the, the, the other big thing that I'm here to tell you, uh, Vine stands for veganism is the next evolution. Um, but, oh, uh, that's our legal name, but it also stands for veganism is not enough. And, um, and so I'm here to tell you, especially if you're new to the movement, that quiet as it's kept, not everybody believes that trying to convince individuals to be vegan is the best use of your time. I just want you to understand that's a perfectly fine thing to do, but there are many people at this conference telling you it is the most important thing you should do, the only thing you could do, and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, there are so many other things uh, that we need people to do. Um, uh, and, 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 and so if you're new, I want you to think about where you might fit in. And if you're somebody here who is an all-time animal advocate, um, who works in vi against vivisection, or against fur, or against circuses, or against the uses of animals in entertainment, then I want you to know that I am here from a farmed animal sanctuary to tell you that I am deeply grateful for your work. Now, I say these things for two reasons. Because uh, I understand something about compassion and because I understand something about the topic that's supposed to be the topic of my talk, which is speciesism. Compassion, what I know, is, and what cows know, is that compassion is not some finite little thing that you have to dole out very, very sparingly, uh, not expending it on this one because you need to save it for that one. Quite the contrary. Quite the contrary. Compassion, in fact, uh, your heart is a muscle that be, like any other muscle becomes more capable of uh, the more you exercise it. Um, and so extending compassion increases the quantity of compassion that you have to extend. Same thing. You know this is true, right? This is a love. We're talking about love here. The more you love, the more love you have. And I understand something about speciesism. Um, and that's what I'm supposed to talk to you about. So. <laughs> Speciesism is uh, the, uh, the uh, discrimination against and exploitation against beings on the basis of species. The idea that, 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 that on account of species you might be bought and sold. You might be liable to be forced to work without compensation. You might be killed. You might be displaced from your home. You might be exploited in various ways. Yes? Uh, because of your species. And that's why we say speciesism. Some of you have been hearing about carnism. Carnism talks about some things that are aspects of speciesism, but it's much more narrow. 
Um, what I'm trying to say is we need to understand speciesism if we want to liberate animals. Um, speciesism uh, has a basic logic or a way of, of thinking about the world or being in the world. There are various speciesist logics. Uh, uh, some of the common ones are might makes right. Yeah, I can just do I want to do it. I can do it, so I will do it. Um, and uh, this excuses uh, or, or doesn't even bother to excuse much animal exploitation. And you know what? Folks who operate on that basis tend to do it much more broadly. We can all think of ways that people have hurt other groups of people or the environment um, on the basis of might makes right as well. Yes? Um, another way is God said so, right? God told me that I could kill you. God made you for me. God told me I could have this land. Yes? Uh, and again, you probably don't need me to tell you that, 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 that the same people who say God made the animals for us to eat have also told us that God told them to smite the homosexuals and, um, and, and take the land of these people because they're heathens. Yes? Okay, so God said so is another logic that is often used for speciesism. But probably most commonly these days are exceptionalism and ableism. Exceptionalism is the idea that the ones who are closest to me, the ones who are most like me, are the specialists. And we're so special that we can exploit everybody else. Um, the flip side of it is they're so inferior uh, that we may legitimately buy and sell them, we may legitimately enslave them, we may legitimately do whatever we want to them, etc. Yes? That's exceptionalism. <coughs> And then, um, and then there's this idea that human beings have some particular capability or capacity, like reason or whatever it might be, and because of that capability or capacity, they may rightfully exploit, enslave, displace, etc. Yes? Yes, and that is also known as ableism. So, that brings me to the, 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 the next point, which is that we can't actually understand speciesism in isolation. We have to understand speciesism in context, right? Uh, speciesism doesn't just exist as some separate thing uh, all on its own that we could just sort of pull out and, <coughs> and it's fixed. Speciesism is deeply embedded in ways of thinking about the world that also are all bound up with ways of thinking about other people and ways of thinking about the environment. Yes? Um, so, so, so this brings us to this idea that I think they thought was the new idea I would talk about today, intersectionality, except that, you know, it's from the 1980s. Um, <laughs> it's just that we're really late thinking about it. Um, so you may have heard this word and you may have even heard or used it uh, as though it were just sort of this uh, vague way of saying that people ought to pay attention to race. Um, and certainly the idea that people ought to pay attention to race is, is part of intersectionality. Uh, but intersectionality is actually uh, it's, it's a very powerful conceptual tool that's very simple but also very deep. People have been working on it for decades. The basic idea is that different forms of oppression, racism, sexism, ableism, etc., uh, 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 don't exist separately, but in fact uh, uh, interact with one another. Uh, they, they, and it's not just that they use the same sort of mindsets and they tend to benefit the same sorts of people, um, or they use the same sorts of tactics, which is stereotyping. Um, it's, it's that they're deeply linked at the root. It's that they're deeply linked at the root. And they interact with one another in ways that support one another. Does this make sense? Yeah, I'm asking the whole room, right? As if I had time to explain it if it didn't. By the way, I read book. Okay, so 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 the different forms of oppression interact with one another um, uh, 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 in ways that is not possible to disaggregate them. What I'm trying to say here is, for example, that women of color experience forms of discrimination that are the result of the intersection of racism and sexism. And these are forms of oppression uh, that, that are not shared by white women or by men of color because they're a product of the interaction between racism and sexism. I hope that makes sense. Uh, the other piece is that the different forms of oppression not only interact with one another, but they support each other. 
Uh, and so if you sort of chip away at this one, but you don't pay attention to that one, that one's going to come and help the other one stay up. So actually, you need to look at this one too. Also, that they interact in ways that they form systems of oppression. Huh? Systems of oppression. And here's a really important point. And the idea is if you want to dismantle the systems of oppression, then you've got to go to the intersections. And why that is, is I, I, I don't have a prop here, but if you've ever, if you think about a wooden table or a wooden chair and you would like to dismantle it, like you could just start banging it, right? Anywhere. But you'd be, you do actually a lot better at dismantling it if you go to the joints. You see what I'm saying? Because it's the joints that are, that are holding the structure together. Um, okay, so that's intersectionality. That's just one of the contexts that we need to understand. Species in the day is they have two minutes. I <laughs> okay, so, 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 the other is ecology. Um, in ecology is a system of relationships, um, speciesism, every problem that we're trying to solve here occurs within systems of relationships, ecosystems, not only, but also ecologies, economies, there we go, economies, social systems, etc. If we try to solve the problem of speciesism without reference to those, we're going to fail. Look, animal activists, too, can get tripped up by speciesism if they don't pay attention to it. And I'm sorry to say that we, we do see this. It's not surprising. Um, when we act like we're the heroes of the animal rights movement, when we feel completely free to substitute our own opinions for things without actually having thought hard about what the non-human animals we purport to be speaking for would really like. That's speciesism. Um, when we suggest that you ought to give rights to this or that animal because they this or that capability, that's ableism. Might, it might be a strategy that you use here and there, but do you really want to walk around saying that, that, that people need to have certain capabilities? If they're going to get rights, I don't know. I think not. An over-reliance on logic. Part of speciesism is this idea that we're the superior animals because we're driven by our very big brains. Um, and, 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 and it's only animals who blah, blah, blah. Okay, so over-reliance on, on logic is another one. Oh, I have to I have to skip all of the things. Um, okay. So, 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 check it out. I, I can't tell you all of the bad things, but please watch out for militarism. Please watch out for racism and sexism in the movement. Please think twice between thinking that we're going, that commodity veganism is going to save us. Um, uh, uh, by which I mean, like, we're going to consume our way to animal liberation. Um, uh, 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 the antidotes. Be an ally to animals. Don't see yourself as a leader of the animal liberation movement. See yourself as an ally of animals who are pursuing their own liberation. Uh, you don't have to fight, uh, 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 think strategically and go for those intersections. And then finally, another slogan that mine has is solidarity is for everybody. Um, solidarity is for everybody. Your heart really is a muscle. Uh, and expanding compassion not only to farmed animals, but also to lions who've had their heads blown off, or black motorists who've had their heads blown off, uh, will only make your heart stronger and only make you better able to work for animal liberation. Thank you very much. Simone, a vegan since college, is an accomplished public speaker and recently 
presented a TEDx talk on activism. Pita's Animal Rahat Sanctuary in India was renamed in her honor. She has traveled to Japan with Sea Shepherd to document the dolphin slaughters and has gotten arrested with Pita at the Rose Parade processing SeaWorld and has appeared on numerous media outlets promoting the vegan lifestyle. Her current focus as a broad uh, board member of social compassion and legislation is to push for a ban on the shipment of live baby chicks in the Postal Service. If you are in California, you may see Simone uh, currently fe excuse me, featured on billboards pressuring the governor and the California Department of Fish and Game to ban bobcat tra trapping, trapping statewide. Vegan Lifestyle Magazine recently put Simone on the cover calling her the Gloria Steinem of Animal Rights Movement. Please help me in welcoming Simone Reyes. I am so happy to be here today, among all of you, the visionaries, the light workers, the freedom fighters, the abolitionists, and the activists. We may not have arrived here on spaceships, but we just as well could have, because we are messengers of infinite intelligence from the future. You are the best, and the brightest, and the most committed social justice movement this world has ever had. And that is why you're here today and why our sisters and brothers are showing up in cities across this country year after year, taking to the streets in sun and rain and sleet and snow, issue after issue, month after month, year after year, to give the voiceless a voice. I have no doubt that generations from now, people will look back on these national animal rights conferences and they will peer at our photos and read our leaflets and listen to our speeches and say, ah, that's where the leaders, the trench workers, and the supporters of the hardest fought social justice movement in history gathered to eat great vegan food <laughs> while they were strategizing the consciousness shift that finally brought open the plight of animals broke open the cages and birthed the true path to animal liberation. But in order to get there, we have to know where we have come from. <laughs> the first law to regulate experimentation was passed by Parliament in the UK and was called the Cruelty to Animals Act of 1876. Almost 50 years ago, here in the United States, the Animal Welfare Act was signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson. It remains the only federal law in the United States that regulates the treatment of some animals, cruelly excluding cold-blooded animals, rats, birds, and mice. At the time, these laws provided a sliver of hope that looked like a promise was being made toward granting animals their birthrights. Now, 139 years later, animals are still burned, electrocuted, cut open, paralyzed, drug-addicted, blinded, terrorized around animals. Humans continue to slaughter billions upon billions of animals each year, brutally taking the lives of innocent animals and sea life, who are still regarded as property, product, and machines. Factory farms, fur farms, circuses, zoos, aquariums, swim with dolphin programs, rodeos, wild horse roundups, carriage horse rides, bullfights, horse races, can hunts, bird shoots, medical research labs, amusement parks, and a plethora of other abuses continue business as usual. Though veganism is now a household word, the state of the world is still in crisis, due largely to man's insatiable appetite for meat and dairy. We are racing toward an imminent global catastrophe in regard to global warming, and let's all mark our calendars for the year 2048. Since we're vegans, we can assume we will all still be alive and keep <laughs> But horrifically, sea life may not. According to a recent study, the loss of ocean biodiversity is accelerating, and 29% of sea world, seafood species that humans consume have already crashed. The long-term trend continues. In 30 years, there will be little to no sea creatures left. Denial is a drug 
that everybody seems addicted to. We are running out of time for people to open their hearts to animals as sentient beings. We are running out of time to save our oceans and our rainforests. We are running out of time to conserve our precious water. We are running out of time to convince the public that the problem is factory farming and the only solution is veganism. We are running out of time to prove that slavery is still alive and well in our treatment of animals. We are running out of time for waiting and pleading and begging. It is time to recognize that we must shake things up. We are a movement to be reckoned with, and it's time that we truly believe that and act accordingly. We don't have to apologize for making people feel badly about their choices if we are speaking the truth. Not as an attack on them, but as an education. We must use this time to train like prize fighters because we are in the fight of their lives. We must be poised and ready to answer every excuse that the abusers throw at us to justify the killing and the skinning and the abusing the animals. We must educate ourselves with arguments to defend our veganism on every front. We have all the science and all the data we need to back us up. We must always be prepared to mobilize and act. We must activate to liberate. We must open our hearts and be proactive with other social justice movements to work on their issues and persuade them to join ours. We must not let our heartbreak rule us. We can cry and we can scream and we can rant about the injustices we see, but we cannot allow them to break us. We must be support for each other and be gentle with ourselves as we have seen evidence of hell on earth, and yet we still must push on even during our darkest hours. I have seen families of dolphins tricked and driven to their brutal deaths before my eyes in Japan. I have walked to shelters and looked into the pleading eyes of animals who would never see the light of day. I have witnessed gentle doves being gunned down before my eyes in the name of sport. I have seen transport trucks driving suffering animals to their horrors again. I have held space with animals too far gone to bring back so that they did not have to die alone. We must not look away even if it breaks our hearts. We must bear witness to the winter of their lives so that we may deliver them to the eternal summer of freedom. We must always be strategizing new ways to incorporate the vegan message to the masses in our professional careers, outside of the movement, and in our social circles. We must raise activists, mentor our youth, on becoming active in their schools and among their peer groups, because it is they who are the animal's future. And when we find ourselves in situations where we feel uncomfortable, we must soldier through them, because the animals don't have time for our comfortable silence. We must raise the bar, and with every victory, raise it higher. It is now 2015. We've sent men into space. We can fly airplanes. We've seen the fall of the Berlin Wall. We're utilizing stem cells to heal. The internet is connecting people all over the world. We have cars that run on zero emissions. We have harnessed solar energy. Historically, we have made giant strides in the fight for equality for African Americans and women and the LGBT community. And yet the animals still wait. So the time has come to cash in on that promise made 139 years ago. That is why we gather at these conferences and on our protest lines and take to our social media accounts to make known that a promise is a promise, spoken or unspoken, and we have unfinished business here. We have all come carrying one message. Enough is enough. And while we have incredible obstacles in front of us, we also have the resolve to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Our fight has positioned us with a stronghold over animal abusers. Just look at the numbers. Official USDA figures show that from 2007 to 2014, there was a decline of 400 million animals killed for meat in the United States. of the 9.5 billion animals killed annually in animal agriculture. 
Gallup numbers show vegetarians in the U.S. are at about 5 to 6 percent, with 2 percent identifying as vegan. We are growing. We are saving lives. We are now moving away from old religious dominion over animal doctrines with messages of a new age dawning as we bite back with words from our current Pope. And I will read a statement of his. The great majority becomes extinct for reasons related to human activity. Because of us, thousands of species will no longer give glory to God by their very existence, nor convey their message to us. We have no such right. on our side with companies like Hampton Creek who are churning out healthier, and here's the sweet spot, cheaper alternatives to animal-based food in what is becoming a very successful undercover vegan takeover. <laughs> we are armed with our undercover investigations that are being shared in record numbers in social media and on major media outlets, forcing big business to change their policies. We have never wavered in our fight against pushback. The ag-gag laws, the false propaganda, the intimidation tactics have never once brought us to our knees the way that the animal abusers had predicted. We have not won every battle, but we have never backed down. We must be encouraged by recent victories, such as the global cry for justice over Cecil the hunted and beloved lion in Zimbabwe. Encouraged by cats and dogs being granted non-human neighbor status in a small town in Spain that is in essence giving them rights only enjoyed by humans. Encouraged by non-human personhood status, dolphins in some countries, and Sandra the orangutan. Encouraged by Salt Lake City banning horse-drawn carriages, and the military ending the use of live animals in medical training. Encouraged by India banning cosmetic testing on animals, and China ending mandatory animal testing on cosmetics. Encouraged by Waza's decision to prohibit its members from acquiring any more dolphins from the cruel dolphin tribes. Encouraged by recent state of our country with all 50 states now having felony animal cruelty statutes. Japan Airlines and China Southern Airlines joining the list of airlines who will no longer ship monkeys to labs. Encouraged by stores like French Connection, Hyperline, Century 21, and Harry Ellis, H&M, and Anthropology, and Forever 21, the list goes on and on, with them dropping Angora from their shelves. The Moscow Circus, ditching animals, encouraged by over half a million animals just saved in Nepal as they canceled their largest animal sacrificing event. <laughs> so sad because of what prompted it, still encouraged by U.S. wildlife designating captive primates as endangered, which means in essence it will make medical research on them virtually impossible. <laughs> now is the time to knock the abusers off their feet. We have what they do not, proof of their lies. We simply cannot lose, but we can't waste time if we don't turn up the heat. We need to raise more money for the cause, get louder. We need to veganize all animal welfare galas and charity auctions. We need to convince the fests and the festivals making money off of the word vegan to get their, their profits back into the movement after expenses. The suffragists were certainly not holding bake sales in the fight for women's equality and using the money to get their hair done. <laughs> We need to grow our numbers by reaching out to other social justice movements, such as the feminists, the human rights activists, and the LGBT communities, and remind them that until all animals are free, we are all still oppressed. Mm -hmm. We must we must the gym, but stop burning down our own. We might disagree on tactics or even on some policies, but if we allow petty grievances to divide us, we are playing right into the abuser's hands. It will only be together, in a united front, that we cannot be defeated. Now is the time to organize occupations. Now is the time to mobilize the public strikes on behalf of animals on set days to show people how much power we have in our wallets. 
through the voices of the voiceless and the protectors of the choiceless. Our empathy and commitment to social justice comes with an honor, but also the burden of responsibility to step up to the plate and come out firing shots of truth and recount the stories of animal suffering that we were born to tell. The animal abusers may have more supporters, they may have more money, they more, may have more access to the media, but we know that it only takes a few bad asses to start a revolution. <laughs> We have come here to tell you that if we cannot change your minds, we will change your laws. We will campaign and we will elect those that put animal rights on their agenda, on their platforms. And if we got you elected and you have not yet delivered on your promises to the animals, we will come down hard on your administration until you do. Mayor de Blasio, I am talking to you. <laughs> up against a wall with the Central Park Conservancy and the Teamsters and the City Council, but a promise is a promise. And we as a community ran a very hardcore campaign to get you into office and we will hold you to it until every New York City carriage horse is off the street. <laughs> continue to lie to your consumers, trying to give them a guilt-free pass, labeling your meat as humane. We will protest at your restaurants. We will disrupt your patron dinners with images depicting exactly what cage-free and grass-fed looks like and what the myth of humane really is. I am talking to you, Chipotle. <laughs> continue to go into the free waters of Japan and other ocean homes, driving families of dolphins and orcas and whales to their death, all in the name of sick entertainment. We will continue to force the chosen ones that you choose. The chosen ones is what I said because only the pretty young ones get the privilege of being slaves for the rest of their lives. And we will show up outside of your entrances, and we will leaflet your patrons. We will crash your parades. We will chain ourselves to your gates, and we will live stream your murders. We are exposing your secrets, and guess what? The world is responding in shock and horror, as they should. We will continue to enlist the support of friends like Anonymous, who will hack into your sites, exposing your dirty little secrets. <laughs> I'm happy to be talking to you, Taiji, SeaWorld, and many others. And SeaWorld, you know what? Your numbers are tanking. You're losing your staff. You're losing your performers. The World Travel Guide has kicked you out of their list. You've not made the airlines. has pulled your promos. The Miami Dolphins have agreed to not renew their partnership with you. California State Long Beach has severed their ties with you. Savings.com have removed their coupons. You are losing customers. You are losing money. And payback is a bitch. Infiltrate our movement, posing as activists, and work for the animal abusers, informing them of our tactics. We will find you, and we will expose you. I am talking to you, Thomas Jones, who I actually got arrested with at the SeaWorld float at the Rose Parade, and others who try to disrupt our activities. We are here to see if you continue to slaughter animals for meat and dairy. We will continue to go undercover and expose your criminal abuse, creating such media firestorms that your suppliers will be dropped over and over. And as we proved with our hero Morrissey, we will take over your stadiums and turn them vegan when we perform there. <laughs> we will take your practices because big business has finally started to catch on. They really don't need or want our bad PR. We are here to say that we will continue to pay your customers to watch true footage that will allow them to meet their meat, changing their minds about what is acceptable and what is criminal. We will keep opening restaurants that bring healthy vegan fare into communities and make them the hottest spots in town like Crossroads in LA. 
We are here to say if you continue to put your animals in circuses, we will take your weapons of torture away. We will ban your bullhooks and we will meet you at every stop along the way with our outreach and we will turn your customers away who will eventually ask for refunds. We are here to say we will implement Meatless Mondays into your workplaces to whet the appetites of your employees, but be warned, we will not stop there. Because just as the slaves in the civil rights fight were never going to be satisfied with just one day off the week, neither will the animals. We are here to say that we will take your entertainment idols, like Beyonce, turn them vegan and convince that they really need to start vegan at-home delivery services for everybody. We will take your presidents and your vice presidents and we will turn them vegan too. We are here to say that we may not all in this room live to see the day of total animal liberation, but the road will rise up to meet our vision because we simply will not settle for less. We will not rest until animals have rights and are no longer viewed as property. We will not rest until our Facebook feeds are of rescued animals only. We will not rest until every mother has the right to raise her baby. We will not rest with just more comfortable cages. We will not stop until there are no more cages. We will rise up to overcome those that tell us it cannot be done and remind them that this is exactly what every slave owner told every slave about their freedom. That is what husbands told their wives about gaining the right to vote, and what homophobes told every gay American when they dreamed of having marital equality. We will rise up to prove them all wrong. We will rise up by exposing every droplet of blood. We will rise up by recording every scream. We will rise up as a collective, unstoppable, invincible movement that takes strength from each other. We will rise up because we are their only hope. We will rise up again and again, over and over in solidarity. We will rise up in faith. We will rise up until every cage is empty and every tank is drained. Rise up, activists, rise up. Unfortunately, we have 11 minutes left to this my um, plenary, but we're going to let Karen, of course, speak for a full 17. So hopefully, you'll still stick around. Um, so Karen Davis will discuss the ethical deviant and pessimism versus negativity in animal activism, challenging the tyranny of custom and complacence in our movement and in the public domain. Karen Davis, PhD, is the founder of pres uh, and, and president of United Poultry Concerns, a nonprofit organization that promotes the, compa the compassionate and respectful treatment of domestic fowl, including a sanctuary for chickens in Virginia. Karen is the author of many published articles and several books, including Prisoned Chickens, Poisoned Eggs, An Inside Look at the Modern Poultry Industry, More Than, more than, half, more than a Meal, The Turkey in History, Myth, Ritual, and Reality, and the Holocaust and the Henry's Tale, A Case for Comparing Atrocities. Karen Davis is in the American, uh, sorry, Animal Rights Hall of Fame and Outstanding Contributions to Animal Liberation. Please welcome Karen Davis. Good morning, everybody. I'm so thrilled to be here and to see all of you here. And uh, it's just a great honor and an opportunity and uh, it's so thrilling to know there are so many people here who care so much about animals and animal liberation. So thank you for being here, and we really thank uh, Farm Animal Rights Movement for putting on this great, splendid conference. So thank you so much. Uh, there's supposed to be a picture of me up there with one of our chickens uh, at our sanctuary in Virginia. I don't know if that picture is going to appear after all, but just so that you know that um, one of uh, our many programs that is of United Poultry Concerns is um, a sanctuary for chickens on the eastern shore of Virginia, which is one of the largest poultry producing areas of the country. 
That's where Patrice and I met uh, down on the eastern shore. They were in Maryland, we're in Virginia. And uh, we both know about those trucks going up and down the road day after day on the back roads, the main roads. And I saw this yesterday driving up from uh, the rural area where we live in Metro Pongo, uh, up here in Washington, and just seeing truckload after truckload after truckload of maybe six-week-old chickens going to slaughter. So this is the kind of uh, an area that we live in, and uh, I know firsthand uh, about the chicken industry and the turkey industry. So um, I started United Poultry Concerns 25 years ago. And at that time, as I will talk about later in a couple of other talks I'm going to be giving at this conference, uh, I was discouraged even by people in the animal advocacy movement from starting an organization for chickens. This was back in the late 1980s because I was told that I could never get an organization going and sustained, sustaining itself that focused only on chickens. Well, that was 25 years ago. So we have done more than sustain ourselves. We are very successful. So I start uh, with that um, observation uh, to say this, that we never ever as animal rights advocates and activists and animal liberationists, we never want to succumb to the naysay and the negative uh, uh, ideas that can discourage us from pursuing the goals that we know we need to pursue for animals and that animals so desperately need us to pursue on their behalf. So don't ever let anybody sit, tell you that something you want to do for animals can't can't be done, or that people aren't ready yet. Don't ever listen to the slogan that people aren't ready yet. Our job as animal advocates and activists is to make people ready. That's our job. So, to get to uh, my presentation, which is ethical deviance and pessimism versus negativity. So how many people in this room consider themselves an ethical deviant? <laughs> how many people in this room consider themselves, himself or herself, an ethical deviant? Okay, well, I'm getting to the definition. Because <laughs> I think when I do it, they go... Maybe there will be more hands. There will be more hands. <laughs> so, um, I came up with this term, this concept, when I was preparing a presentation for a panel discussion at the uh, City College of New York a few months ago. And I had started off with a uh, very famous poem by uh, the uh, English poet William Wordsworth. Intimations on uh, uh, Odon, uh, Intimations of Immortality, in which he talks about the loss in growing up of his childhood rapture with nature, his, his primal sympathy with the natural world, and how as he grew older, that light darkened and he lost that that original feeling that he had had for the natural world in becoming an adult. So a question that many of us ask in our movement is, if we assume that most children have a primal sympathy and empathy with other animals, we're animals, so we're talking about other animals, and our language is so limiting, we always have to use terms like non-human animals, which I don't like. So let's just say that with members of other species, with other animals, if children do have this primal sympathy within, genetically based, what happens? Why does this, an iron curtain seem to fall between the child and the adult? So that by the time people 
are adults, or as they are going into their teenage years, if they had that primal sympathy for animals, it becomes so overlaid with other interests, other competing emotions, competing desires, competing goals. So, if we assume that the child, so to speak, the sort of idea of the child, the concept of the child, the genetic pattern that we call the child, is in most, most of us. One thing I would say, in my experience as an animal rights activist, as well as I was a juvenile probation officer for five years in Baltimore City, and I taught English at the University of Maryland for 12 years. And so I have, to, and I even taught in a kindergarten way back when, and it was called the Little Red Hen. <laughs> and uh, at that time, it was a preschool, but, you know, two to six year old, six year old children. Um, I had no idea at that time that uh, that was uh, the name, that was who I was going to be. <laughs> so to speak. Um, but anyway, I dealt with uh, uh, young people uh, from the age of two through college. So, and then being an animal rights activist started since 1983, so I, I'm, uh, I've been around now for over 30 years, and very, very active in the animal rights movement, and having started the United Poultry Service then in um, 1990. So one of the things that I have found is that there are many people who care very much about animals, inwardly. But many people live among other people who they're afraid of. They're afraid that other, the other people in their community will laugh at them or ostracize them or ridicule them if they express compassion for animals. Now, you know, most people in, in our society, it's, it's uh, normative, it's acceptable to care about your, your pet dog, your pet cat, and maybe a pet canary or a parakeet. But there are still large parts of the country and in all societies, but certainly if you're living, for example, in rural areas, not necessarily only rural areas, but still there are a lot of places where, and not to speak of the entire planet, where people are hesitant to express the natural primal sympathy for animals that they feel. They fear ostracism. They fear ridicule. How many children living, for example, in family farms, secretly hated the cattle branding season, secretly hated the slaughter, groomed and loved an animal, a cow or a pig, as part of the 4-H program. And when they finally went to the, went to the auction, it was wake up for them, that this animal had been groomed and loved and petted and nurtured to be hauled into a truck and sent to a slaughterhouse. A Canadian activist and a wonderful, wonderful artist, uh, visual artist uh, for uh, farmed animals and all kinds of animals named uh, Twyla Francois. <laughs> And a very close friend and colleague of, of mine and of many people here in this room, obviously, I'm glad to say, she described growing up in Manitoba, a very rural community, and how children are socialized to detach themselves from animals, um, to detach themselves from feelings about animals, to learn, to grow up, and stop being sentimental about animals and face the real world. And an ex example she gives in a very good anthology called Sister Species, which I believe we have at our exhibit table here, and Lisa Kammerer, I believe she's maybe here in this room, uh, she is the editor of that, uh, that, that wonderful book. Um, Twyla has, Twyla Francois has an article in there in which she talks about a very close friend of hers who had raised a cow for 4-H. 
And when she went to the, um, whatever it is, the auction or whatever, and realized that she had to surrender her beloved cow to go to slaughter, to be loaded into the truck to go to slaughter, she started to cry, and she was so upset, and Twyla was there with her. And she said, the auctioneer came over and quickly handed her a $1,000 check. And Twyla wrote in her article, she said, how, how shocked she was to see her friend, who was crying over her beloved cow going to this horrible slaughter, how quickly her friend brightened up and started talking about how she was going to spend the money. So what we're looking at is not only a conflict between ourselves within, our primal sympathies with animals, our empathy, our compassion, our fellowship, our sense of fellowship, but we're also looking at conflicts within ourselves. Because society is an extrapolation, if you will, an extension of the psychology of humans. That's where society comes from. It is an extension and expression of our psychology. So these conflicts are not only between me and an external world, but it's within ourselves that we have to contend with. Because compassion, as strong as it is in most people, or at least many people, has to compete a lot of, against a lot of other very, very strong emotions and problems. It has to fight. You really have to fight to keep your compassion. Your compassion's head up, you might say. With so many competing forces around you that really do not encourage compassion beyond a very circumscribed uh, amount of expression. So, who is the ethical deviant? The eth ethical deviance, I say, is the element in society that prevents socialization from becoming sclerotic. You know, like sclerosis, where you can't move anymore, where you're just rigid and fixed. So the social deviant is the one who prevents the socializing process from becoming sclerotic. The ethical deviant opens a window to let in fresh air, fresh ideas, and fresh perceptions. The ethical deviant may be thought of as the quote-unquote child within a society who, fortunate for that society, will not grow up to be just another replica. The ethical deviant reassures people whose sensibilities have not been totally crushed or driven underground that they are not crazy for caring about a chicken. And an ethical deviant, as an animal rights activist, never ever says when they are out there in their advocacy role, starting their sentence or their advocacy by saying, I know a lot of people think I'm crazy for caring about a chicken, or whoever it is they're advocating for. We never ever apologize for those Holders of. We never start out by saying, I know and I'm crazy for caring about a chicken or whoever it may be. No, we're always confident. We are always self confident. Without confidence and without courage, it doesn't matter what else we do, we are not a good advocate. We're not an advocate, in fact. An advocate, think about a court of law. An advocate is somebody who takes a strong position and makes a case for their client. That's who we are as animal advocates. We are an advocate. We don't apologize. We don't start off weak. We start off and maintain strong, strong advocacy. Woo. So, the ethical deviant refuses to be bullied into becoming 
a slave or a clone in order to belong. The ethical deviant really provides a social service. In a very real sense then, an invaluable sense, the child, quote unquote, aka ethical deviant, is a grown-up. In his ode on intimations of immortality, the poet, the English poet William Wordsworth, contrasts, as I said at the beginning, his instinctual, unreflecting passion for the natural world as a child with the, what he called the years that bring the philosophic mind. Um, the years that bring the philosophic mind, the years that we learn about the world as we mature. The ethical deviance primal sympathy with and insight into the life of things matures to become the conscious sensibility, the awareness and purposefulness of the adult. This person is the poet, the peacemaker, the social justice advocate, the animal rights activist. The quote unquote outsider who keeps the consciousness and conscious conscience of society alive and growing. Some years ago, I was asked to write um, something for a, a book on veganism, and uh, the question came up. Uh, I've heard people over the years in the animal advocacy movement talk about how when they became vegan, they, they, they felt more peaceful after they became vegan. And I express myself this way about becoming vegan. I said, and I must still say, that veganism has not made me more feel more peaceful at all. <laughs> capable and committed and uh, uh, confident and uh, all of those things. But in a world like this, um, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to be at peace. I, 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 I do not have peace. Yes. So. <laughs> um, I mean, you have to maintain your sanity, but that doesn't mean you have to feel peaceful. <laughs> So I said, uh, veganism has made me more conscious of behavior patterns that are not consistent with my adherence to philosophic veganism. Being vegan has not made my personality more peaceful, as by some sort of physiological or mystical transformation or holistic purification. <laughs> However, it has made me more intellectually aware of my feelings and my behavior, and less able to rationalize and do certain things that I might otherwise do or overlook. It has made me more conscious, more aware, and being conscious is so important. This is where instinct becomes enlightenment, what that is our best instincts. So, how much more time? <laughs> Oh, okay, so I'm about done now because um, I know time is running out. So I'll just say this in conclusion, and I do, uh, let me just say this too before I come to the conclusion. Uh, if you come to our table, uh, the United Poultry Concerns in the exhibit hall, right inside the doors there, um, you can pick up uh, the uh, article that I wrote that includes ethical uh, deviance, and also uh, the discussion I was going to get into here, but there's not really time to do it, on uh, uh, pessimism versus negativity, but I'll just say this. Pessimism is an assessment of the world and its process, prospects. Negativism is an attitude of defeatism. We must never be negative as animal rights advocates. We may be pessimistic about the way things are, but that's a whole different thing from being negative. We must never be negative. We must never, ever negate hope for animals. But we must always be strong. So I'm just going to close with this. Because this is also an important thing I hear in our movement. 
And I want to challenge this for everybody. An important point is that we must never take for granted that people, quote unquote, over 25 are unreachable, unteachable, or dispensable in our quest to make compassion for animals part of the socialization process. Not only is this assumption dead wrong, but children who are surrounded by adults who do not support their feelings for animals will often turn against themselves as well as against the animals as a result of having had feelings of compassion for animals as children that did not seem to be shared or understood by the adults in their world. So our best hope is not five-year-olds. Our best hope is five-year-olds who are supported by adults who have matured their own primal sympathies and nurtured their own primal sympathies to maturity. So let us be those adults for all the children that are coming into this world whom animals need so much to join our ranks and be part of the next generation. Thank you.